Battles recorded in historical books often provide valuable lessons, especially on military strategy, diplomacy, and even business. A battle between the Romans and the Samnites sometime in the 320s BCE provide unique lessons. I welcome you to my YouTube channel where I explore ancient texts. The ancient texts I explore in this channel are those that have been around for thousands of years. At the moment, I'm going through from the founding of the city by Titus Livius or Livy. This collection of books covers the history of Rome from its founding by Romulus in the 750s BCE to the time when Augustus was emperor, which was close to 0 AD. If you have not subscribed, subscribe so that you do not miss any of the videos I publish. The Semnites were a tribe living southeast of Rome. They were among the tribes ancient Rome often went to war with. In the year that Titus, Veturius, Calvanus, and Spurius Postumius were consuls, which could have been between 325 and 320 BCE, the Semnites were determined to conquer Rome. Their leader was Caius Pontius, whom Livy describes as the son of Erenius Pontius, a highly respected politician and military general. Caius Pontius devised a strategy to trap the Roman army and the consuls. He sent out several scouts parties disguised as shepherds to graze animals near the Roman military camps at Galatia. When the Romans interrogated each of these bands of seemingly patrolists, they got the same message. Livy writes, he sent to Calatia where he heard that the Roman consuls were encamped, ten soldiers in the habit of shepherds, and ordered them to keep some cattle feeding in the several different places at small distance from the Roman posts, and that when they fell in with any of their foragers, they should all agree in the same story, that the legions of the Samnites were then in Apulia, that they were besieging Luceria with their whole force, and very near taking it by storm. Luceria was an ally of Rome, and the Romans were obliged to protect the city from the Samnites. The Roman army could take one of two roads to Luceria. One went along the coast but was longer, and it could take many weeks to reach Luceria using it. The other option was the road through a sharp valley known as the Caudine Fox. It was shorter and therefore could allow the Romans to reach Luceria before it was too late. The Romans decided to use the shorter route, even though it was more risky. Livy writes, the nature of the place is this. There are two deep glens, narrow and covered with wood, connected together by mountains ranging on both sides from one to the other. Between these lies a plain of considerable extent enclosed in the middle, abounding in grass and water, and through the middle of which the passage runs. Once the entire army entered the valley, it quickly occurred to everyone that it was a trap. The exit was sealed with huge stones and logs. Turning back, they found that the other side had also been sealed after they entered the valley. Meanwhile, the Samnites appeared on both sides of the valley. Livy says that it was apparent to every soldier that there was no escaping, they were exposed and helpless. However, instead of giving up and maybe sitting around to wait for death, the Romans chose to act as if everything was under control. They started to set up a camp within the valley while the Samnites watched. Livy writes, After some time, when they saw that the consul's pavilion were being erected and that some were getting ready the implements for throwing up wax, although they were sensible that it must appear ridiculous, they attempt to raise a fortification in their present disparate condition, and when almost every hope was lost, will be an object of necessity. Yet not to add a fault to their misfortunes, they all, without being advised or ordered by anyone, set earnestly to work and then closed a camp with a rampart. This action might have saved them by confusing the Samnites, who held back, watched, and for a moment didn't know what to make of the actions of clearly cornered Romans. Indeed, the Samnite was so confused that they sent out for advice from their elders. Livy writes, Nor could the Samnites, though in circumcise so joyous, instantly determine how to act. It was therefore universally agreed that Herenius Pontius, father of the general, should be consulted by a letter. Herenius Pontius told the Samnite general to either release Romans with no conditions or kill all of them. Livy writes, By his first plan, which he esteemed the best, he meant by an act extraordinary kindness to establish perpetual peace and friendship with a most powerful nation, by the other to put off the return of war to the distance of many ages, during which the Roman state after the loss of those two armies could not easily recover its strength. The advice was not taken, and it was the biggest mistake the Samnite made and caused their own downfall. 
instead of releasing Romans under no conditions and forming an alliance or killing the entire army to remove the threat, the Samnite forced them into a negotiated surrender and acknowledgement that they were conquered. They offered Romans the most humiliating surrender conditions. At first, Romans were so disgusted that many considered the option of being massacred better. The wisdom of one general prevailed. He reminded everyone that no one would protect the city if the entire army were killed, that it was better to endure the shame of being conquered and to live to fight another day. With this advice accepted, Roman soldiers surrendered their weapons and were stripped naked. About 600 horsemen were held as security until the Roman public assembly ratified the surrender to the Samnites. When the soldiers and the consuls arrived home, they were too ashamed to show their faces publicly. They hid in their homes. While most Romans were dejected, one Ovilius Calavius, son of Ovius, a highly distinguished man, saw something good in those negative emotions. He explained that they could be transformed into a positive force. Livy quotes him saying, This obstinate silence, those eyes fixed on the earth, those ears deaf to all comfort, with a shame of beholding the light, are indications of a mind calling forth, from its innermost recesses, the utmost exertions of resentment. Either he was ignorant of the temper of the Romans, or that silence will shortly excite among the Samnites lamentable cries and groans, for that the remembrance of the Chaldean peace will be much more sorrowful to the Samnites than to Romans. Each side will have their own native spirit wherever they should happen to engage, but the Samnites will not everywhere have the glens of Caudium. Marcus Aumilius Papus was appointed dictator and he picked Lucius Valerius Flaccus as his master of the horse. Meanwhile, Spurius Postumius and Titus Veturius, the two reigning consuls when the Samnites captured the Roman soldiers at Caudine Fox, offered themselves to be handed over to the Samnites as prisoners so that Rome could be discharged from the proposed surrender treaty. This turned out to be a resourceful technicality in existing law of nations and the Samnites had no option beside accepting to arrest and punish these two individuals or declaring war on Rome. They chose the latter. It became apparent that they should have considered either making Rome a friend or destroying it completely when they had the leverage. Livy writes, They now, too late and in vain, applauded the plans of all Pontius by blundering between which they had exchanged the possession of victory for uncertain peace and having lost the opportunity of doing a kindness or an injury, were now to fight against men whom they might have either put out of the way forever as enemies or engaged forever as friends. In the following war, the Samnites were crushed and Rome survived. If you found this video interesting, please take a moment to hit the like button. I also welcome your comments. See you in the next video.